Before I get in the sermon this evening, just a moment if I may, I'd like to uh, all of us to be able to express some joy and gratitude for Mabel. Tonight, after our service, we're going to be having some moments to rejoice with her. Her 100th birthday is going to be this week. And, you know, when you think about age, it's not the, the amount of years that you have in life, it's the question how you live those years. Amen? And the reason I say that, I remember the guy who lived the longest on earth, 969 years. Can you imagine? Methuselah. Do you know what year Methuselah died? In the year of the flood. Now, I don't know for sure he died in the flood. But what I find interesting is this man who lived 969 years, what do we know about his love for God or his devotion to God? We just know he lived a long time. And what I know that all of us here who love Mabel, we respect her sweet heart, don't we? We respect her faith. We respect her kindness. And uh, Mabel has been a wonderful example to all of us of love for God and faith. And uh, I, I'm grateful tonight that we're going to have an opportunity just to uh, express our love and devotion to her, our appreciation for her. I hope tonight you can stay a few minutes and uh, just let her know how much you care and are thankful for her. I'm always intrigued, uh, some of you, uh, in fact it's interesting tonight, and those of you who may be with us uh, on live stream tonight, we're really glad you're with us. Um, I got a text message this morning from Tina at 11.30. I'm telling you, I hadn't much gotten out of the pulpit. And uh, Tina was telling me about what it meant to her being sick this morning to have that and to be able to be with all of us in worship. And uh, Hillary was telling me uh, as we were coming down the hall about being sick a couple of weeks and what it meant to him to be able to have that. And it's almost like if I'm just right there in the midst of you. And so to those of you who are with us tonight uh, in live streaming or uh, who will see this later, we're grateful for the privilege. Technology is a wonderful blessing. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it's a pain. <laughs> but uh, we're grateful for it and grateful that uh, people can have an opportunity to, uh, to worship and to uh, study with us the Word of God as we open it together. Well, we spent a long time getting through studies of the Old Testament and some of the great events of the Bible. The last study we did was on the intertestamental time. And tonight we open our Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 1. And while you're doing that, just some observations and thoughts. Have you ever waited and waited, and waited for a promise, and felt like it's never going to happen. Tonight we're going to look at the birth of John the Baptizer. You know from the beginning of the Bible, I'm, I'm talking about in the Garden of Eden, God made a promise in Genesis 3 about a Messiah coming who was going to, in essence, stomp the head of Satan. Imagine this wait. 4,000 years. Yes, God has promised that one of the descendants of Eve is going to crush the head of Satan. And it still hasn't occurred. Or imagine this wait, 1900 years, 
God had promised Abraham that one of his descendants would bless, bless all the nations of the world. And it still hasn't happened. Or imagine this wait. God had promised through Isaiah that a Messiah was going to be born of a virgin. And it still hasn't happened. And then you get down to Malachi in the Old Testament. And it seems that as if God has just been silent. And for a period of 400 years, no prophecy, no speech, no statement from God. I wonder as I thought about this this week how the Jews must have felt. God? Are you gone? You're not going to talk to us anymore? As I mentioned in our last lesson, we studied about the intertestamental history. And I mentioned in that last study that God planned the perfect time to bring the Messiah into the world. Statements like this in Galatians 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Or again in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and especially 10, in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together and one all things in Christ. God knew all along what and when, but man didn't. As we saw last week, the time is now about at hand. And tonight, we began to see something else that's so important about the coming of the Messiah. I began tonight by looking at some Old Testament prophecies about John. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Or again, Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, that last prophet in the Old Testament days made this statement. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The mission of John the baptizer was twofold. Number one, to make ready all things for the coming of the Messiah. Number two, he would prepare the hearts of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, for the Messiah. Question. Have you ever noticed that he's described as one crying in the wilderness? Why is he described that way? Well, by the way, wilderness here doesn't mean what you and I think wilderness trees and all kinds of uh, unkempt property and maybe mud and so forth. No, the idea is desert. He's described one crying in the wilderness of the desert because his mission was going to be preached to preach in the wilderness, in the desert. Secondly, why is he called Elijah? Not that he is Elijah reincarnate, but rather, he is, as Elijah the prophet, is like a type of this one who's coming. John the baptizer was going to be an itinerant preacher who lives in the wilderness, in the desert. He's not a city guy. He would be totally comfortable in the desert setting. He would be a man of the earth. He was very similar to Elijah, that Old Testament prophecy, in mission in temperament, in love for God, and in his proclamation about God and his will. And so you have the Old Testament declaring that a Messiah is coming. Now secondly, we're going to read tonight some prophecy to Zacharias and to Elizabeth. 
And what I'm going to do in this as we read this tonight, I'm going to just read a few phrases and then we're going to stop and talk about them rather than read the whole thing and come back. So I'd like for you, if you would, to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. Luke 1 and verse 5. And we're going to read and talk about these verses. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, Rome was the worldwide empire at this time. Herod was a descendant of Esau. He was an Edomite. If you remember what I told you in the last lesson, how the Greeks changed some terminology, he would have been called in the first century by those of the Roman, by, by the, the influence of Greek uh, thought, an Idumean. Uh, he was the king of Judea during the time of these events that we're reading about tonight. But let's go further. A certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. We're introduced now to a priest who comes to serve at the temple. His name is Zacharias. If you notice that phrase, the division of Abijah, that's an important statement. Because David and Zadok and Ahimelech divided the Levites into 24 different divisions back in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 7 to 18. These divisions of priests served at the temple for a week at a time. They would come from wherever their homes were. They would come to the temple. They would serve in whatever capacity they had at that week. And then they would go back home. Watch this. They did this once in the first part of the year. They did it once in the second part of the year. So that got 48 weeks. And then you had the three weeks of the festivals, obviously, of uh, Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Ingatherings. Their responsibilities, what lot they were, were chosen in 1 Chronicles 24 and verse 5. Abijah was the 8th division. And so Zacharias, as we're introduced to him here in the text, is at his appointed time, he's come to Jerusalem to serve at the temple. Now let's go further in our reading. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Zacharias was married to a woman of the family of Aaron, Elizabeth, as we've read. And this husband and wife were a devout couple. God describes them as righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, verse 6. By the way, if you go back to Matthew's account in Matthew 1, verse 19, Joseph is described as a just man. They had one heart-rending struggle for a Jewish couple. Read with me verses 6 and 7 that talks about this. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. And so we learn some things about them here. They're quite aged. She doesn't have a child. There doesn't seem to be any possibility of having a child. Now as we go further in the text, verses 8 and 9, observe what happened. So it was, that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, he's there at that week of the temple, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The suggestion here seems to be that these priests cast lots uh, for areas of service during that week that they were going to be at the temple. By the way, burning incense was a huge honor. The priest who got this privilege had such a huge honor because he had the privilege of taking that incense right into the veil before you go into the most holy place and to put that incense on the altar of incense. What is interesting as you read about this is other priests would go in with him. Then 
uh, they would exit, leaving him, the one who's doing that burning of the incense, they would leave him uh, in that holy place in the temple by himself to offer the incense. If you look at verse 10, there's a whole multitude of people who are outside. They're praying at the hour of incense. So there's a lot of people who know that Zacharias has gone into the temple and they're standing outside waiting for him uh, to come out. Now, if you will, let's go down and read verses 11 and down through 17. Read with me, please. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell on him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, wi uh, to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, you can amaze, uh, be, imagine with Zacharias standing there getting ready to offer this incense and all of a sudden there's an angel standing on the right hand of that altar. That would kind of shake you up. He was frightened, verse 12. But the angel's message is, Zacharias, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayer. You've been praying about your wife having a son. God is going to grant that request and his name is going to be John. He's going to bring joy and gladness to you and your wife, but also to many. Here's a suggestion about his mission being to help people come to pre preparation for the Messiah. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be a Nazarite. He won't drink wine or strong drink. By the way, if you're studying and would like more details, go back to number 6 and you can learn about the Nazarite vow. Verse 15, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his verse. He's going to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, and he's going to be like Elijah. He's going to be a powerful man and fearless in his message. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. All of this is about preparing people for the Messiah to come. But again, verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. The question. Zechariah wanted to know, How in the world am I going to know that this is really going to happen? Notice now, verses 19 and 20, and Gabriel gives a supernatural pronouncement of what's going to happen. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Zacharias, you struggle with this a little bit? Okay, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to be able to speak. And by the way, that's not the whole story. Verse 62, if you'll turn down in the text, gives, I think, more insight into this. So they made signs to his father of what he would have him be called. The suggestion here is that he was unable to speak or to hear. And Gabriel says to Zacharias, there's going to be a supernatural manifestation to prove that this message that I'm giving you is true. You'll not be able to speak, you'll not be able to hear until the day that baby's born. Well, folks, he's saying at least nine months from now, that's going to be your condition. Verse 21, here's what happens outside. Verse 21, the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. I am sure these people are out there saying, what in the world has taken him so long? He's gone in to make this sacrifice of the burnt offering. Where is he? Well, 
When he exited, verse 22, notice what happened. But when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. He couldn't talk. After his days of this service at the temple occur, verse 23, notice what happens. Uh, so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now, afterward, he went home from his service. Elizabeth got pregnant, and she remained in seclusion for five months, verse 24. During that six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, Mary went to visit Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, if you'll turn down further, verses 39 and 40. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, that baby John, the Bible describes, leapt in her womb. I want to make just two observations about this text. I find it interesting what God says in Scripture in contrast with what I hear a lot of people say in our culture. Well, what's inside of a woman is just a bunch of fetal tissue. Really? Well, it's fascinating to me. God says what was inside of her. A baby. Number two, I find it interesting that that baby responded to the excitement of Mary's greeting Elizabeth. He leapt in her womb. What an amazing statement. Verse 56 tells us that Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned back to Nazareth. So she stays there up until very close to the time when Elizabeth is going to deliver John, but not until the time specifically. And so there's the events about uh, Zacharias in the temple and uh, Mary, or excuse me, Elizabeth becoming pregnant with John. Now let's go further in the text, down to verse 57, if you will. And we're going to look at the birth and the naming of John the baptizer. Verse 57, let's start. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. So she gave birth to this baby boy. What happens? Verse 58. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives are so excited. This woman who's been barren, for years and years, she's wanted a child. She's at the point it seemed like no possibility of having a child. God has blessed her with a son. You know in studying Jewish culture in the Old Testament, this barren Jewish woman was blessed with a son, and that was a thrilling blessing in the culture. Her barrenness has been removed. God has given her a son. But now, as we go further in the text... We're going to read about what occurs in the naming of this child. So let's go to 59 and 60, please. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But his mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. On the eighth day, the day of circumcision of a boy, People were going to name him Zacharias. If you want to read some about the concept of circumcision, you might write down Leviticus 12, 3 or Genesis 17 and verse 12. They're going to name him by his dad's name. But Elizabeth was adamant, and she adamantly resisted the name, naming the boy Zacharias. Again, look at verse 60. No, he'll be called John. In Jewish culture, the oldest boy was often given the name of his dad. The boy was often named on the day of his circumcision, although that was not a command under the law of Moses, but it often occurred in that culture. Notice verse 61, what the friends do. But they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who's called by this name. You don't have anybody in the family named John. Where in the world did you come up with that name? Verses 62 and 63, observe. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, 
His name is John. So they all marveled. So Zacharias makes motions to get a tablet and writes John on that. Can you imagine seeing that and how those people reacted? Ah, but something supernatural occurs instantly, verse 64. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue loosened and he spoke praising God. Ah, oh, remember back in verse 20? That angel said, you're not going to be able to speak to all these things occur. These things what? This child goes through the process of nine months of being inside of his mother, and when he's born, after that, you'll be delivered from not being able to speak. Well, observe the reaction that occurs. He asked for that uh, writing uh, tablet, and I want to look at three or four verses here that just show some of the reactions of family and friends and acquaintances. 63, they marveled. Verse 65, then fear came upon all those who dwelt around them, and all these things were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. People are saying, what in the world is going on here? There's something unique here. There's something supernatural here. What in the world is it that brought about Elizabeth's conception? What in the world is it that Zacharias, for nine months, couldn't speak or hear? What in the world is it that the name that was given, Zacharias confirms? They're amazed at all of these events that happened. And then notice verse 66 in the text. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts saying, What kind of child will this be? Is this some unique child that's born into the world? What's really happening here? And observe that little statement. Next of all, the hand of the Lord was with him. Verse 66. From here and down through verse 79, Zechariah gives a prophetic song. Would you read it with me, starting at 67? And let's go down through 79. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, uh, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who would hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare, to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And in this song, Zechariah, as he's filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies, praises God for visiting and redeeming his people. He's talking about the coming Messiah in verses 68 through 70. In verses 71 to 75, he talks about God has promised salvation and deliverance for the Jews, that they would be saved from their enemies, and the prophecy that he swore to Abraham that he would deliver them from their enemies, and they would serve him without fear and live in holiness and righteousness all the days of their lives. Verses 76 and 77, he declared that John would be a prophet of God who would prepare the way for the Lord. And in verses 78 and 79, salvation is going to be in the kingdom of this Messiah who comes. And John grew, verse 80. By the way, this may remind you of a verse in the next chapter. So the child grew and became strong in spirit, 
and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. That's talking about his work. We're not going to look at that tonight. But John grew. He became a strong personality. And he was being prepared for his mission to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, I want to conclude this tonight by looking at some of the providential preparation for the Messiah to come as it continues. Let me remind you about our last study. In the last lesson, we saw how God used events in empires and cultures for the time to be right to bring the Messiah into the world. We saw that in the 400 years of the period of silence, God was still working providentially, although we don't have scripture about it, but we saw events that occurred, things like this. The influence of the Greek culture upon the world. The influence of the Greek language on the common people through Koine Greek. This enabled people to speak a common language that was going to be so helpful. The opportunities of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids gave the Jewish, that they gave the Jewish people as Ptolemy Philadelphus invited Jews to Egypt. And almost a million of them went there. And the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation from the Hebrew Old Testament, was now made and people could all read that Old Testament in the Greek language. Terrific influence upon the Jewish synagogues. We saw as Seleucus Nicator was very kind to the Jews, and we saw how another ruler, Antiochus III, lowered the taxes and allowed Jews to live by their own laws. The influence of the Greek culture upon the Jews, permeating Jewish culture and society, and names being changed like we heard tonight, that one about not Herod being the Edomite, but being called an Idumean, that has influence from the Greek culture. And then we saw last time also about the Romans, as they brought the preparation of the empires to a climax, as world circumstances and cultures made it a perfect time for the Messiah to come into the world. And here we see, we have things ready as the, the Romans brought rule and order, a rule of law and order to the world. The massive highway system that they made throughout the, the Roman Empire and the impact of connecting Rome with the ends of the empire and their legal system that brought protection to those who in some religions were considered as bigots and hated. And the Jews are going to have opportunities uh, to have some civil support. All of these events were crucial to the spread of Christianity in the first century. Ah, but one thing remained. And that one thing that remained was preparation of the Jewish nation itself. Do you understand there was a need for the Jewish nation to be ready for the Messiah to come? Now, the world's ready. The Jewish nation, not yet. Tonight's lesson, folks, is about God making the last preparation. What had to be prepared? The Jewish people. And so God supernaturally brings about this conception of John. He became the prophet of God who would call the Jewish people to repentance. He would, as we've heard the statement many times, prepare the way for the Messiah to come. He would call them to repentance. The Jewish culture was a wicked culture with corrupt priests. By the way, remember some of the things we talked about in the last lesson. Some had taken the priesthood and taken it out of the Levites and sold it to some people who were corrupt. So the Jewish culture had corrupt priesthood. It had sectarianism. The people were miserable and unhappy at that time. And as we saw in our text tonight, Luke chapter 1 verse 17, he's going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Remember what Zechariah said in that song? Verse 76, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. I want you to see it tonight. The birth of John is getting ready for the mission of John, which just before Jesus comes and is introduced to the world and is about his mission.
John is now ready to get these Jews prepared and the time is right for the Messiah to come. The great message of the birth of John and heading toward his ministry and his mission is this. Now the time for the Messiah is at hand. It's come. Everything is ready for the Messiah to come into the world. The wait is almost over. Go back with me to the beginning of the lesson. Imagine waiting 4,000 years. Is it ever going to happen? Imagine waiting 1,900 years. Is it ever going to happen? Imagine waiting 750 years. Is it ever going to happen? And the message of Luke chapter 1. And the birth of John the baptizer. God is now ready to bring this Messiah that's been promised into the world. Isn't that thrilling? Aren't you glad we live on this side of the cross and, and we have the revelation of the Holy Spirit and we can look backward and see these things and just see God bring it all together and it's ready for Jesus to come into the world. I hope tonight as we look at these things you rejoice. It's a great, great event. As everything is finally brought together. For who we sometimes call the Christ child. To come to the world. This evening I urge us to rejoice. In what we see. To glory in God. And his plans and his wisdom. And to understand. The fullness of time is now at hand. This evening, we extend the invitation of this great God who cares so much, who's made all of these plans because he wants us to see the Messiah and our need for him. This evening, we extend this invitation. If any way you need to have help from God, help from Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.